Hello, my name is Aaron. I work here at the Colony Palm Beach. Today I'll be making a French 75 in honor of culture and cocktails, the 16th season. What goes into this cocktail is any type of gin. Today we'll be using Hendrix straight out of Scotland. You can use any type of champagne, Prosecco. Today we're using Italian silk bar. There's only two other ingredients. One is fresh lemon juice. The second is any type of simple syrup or sugar syrup. Now to start this cocktail, we'll fill up our glass with ice. We'll start with our gin, the only liquor. We'll use two ounces. Now on top of the two ounces of gin, we'll go for half ounce of lemon juice, half ounce of simple sugar, and then we'll start to shake. After you've poured all the contents of your shaker into the glass, we'll finally top off with your champagne. Thank you, Dave. First, we wanna give an enormous thank you to the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County for hosting tonight's Culture and Cocktails Chat. As you can see, they put on a classy event and we hope we're classy enough to measure up to it. And a big thank you to all of you wonderful people out there in the dark. Classic film fans are smart, fun, and brilliant, if we say so ourselves. Tonight, my partner in crime is a New York Times bestselling author, a classic film historian, a professor, and a bon vivant. I'm a bit biased though, because I've been married to him for 34 years. That's why we aren't social distancing. Scott Eyman is the author of 15 books, including the 2014 New York Times bestseller, John Wayne, The Life and Legend, and two other New York Times bestsellers with veteran actor Robert Wagner. His latest book, Cary Grant, A Brilliant Disguise, was published in October. Among his other books are Hank and Jim, The 50-Year Friendship of Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart, Empire of Dreams, The Epic Life of Cecil B. DeMille, Lion of Hollywood, The Life and Legend of Louis B. Mayer, Print the Legend, The Life and Times of John Ford, Ernst Lubitsch, Laughter in Paradise, and The Speed of Sound, Hollywood and the Talkie Revolution. Scott was the 2014 recipient of the National Board of Review William K. Everson Award for Film History for his body of work. His journalism and criticism work made him a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He's won multiple writing awards for his biographies, feature writing, film, and literary criticism. A little known fact, Scott also won a regional Emmy Award for TV comedy writing. He's an adjunct professor of film history at the University of Miami and is a frequent guest for Turner Classic Movies, programming both at, on the film, on the, the channel, and on screen. By the way, he'll be introducing some Cary Grant movies on November 29th this year. He has lectured extensively around the world, done the commentary tracks for many DVDs, and currently writes book reviews for the Wall Street Journal. He's the former literary and art critic for the Palm Beach Post, previously wrote for the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel and was entertainment editor for the Miami News. Plus, he's been the answer twice for Jeopardy questions. Okay, I'm exhausted reading that. Let's call it a night and go drink some cocktails. Oh, but wait, there's more. Um, right now, you're seeing a photo of the cover of one of Scott's book. What was your first showbiz bio and why did you write it? Uh, Mary Pickford, Bob Mary Pickford. Aren't you glad I knew that? I'm glad you knew that one. <laughs> she hasn't one. given me any of the first questions. First one down. So no, he I'm, doesn't know I'm anything. I'm flying blind here. Yeah. Uh, why did I write it? Well, I, I thought if I stayed in journalism uh, without raising the bar, I'd be an alcoholic in four or five years. So I needed to do something to challenge myself. And uh, I, I basically, I knew I wanted to write about silent films because that was my uh, entry drug to, to, to old movies. So I just made a short list of people uh, who had worked in silent films that I thought A, deserved a good book and B, that I might conceivably with blind amount of luck be able to get published. Uh, and Pickford was one of five or six other people on the, on the list. And I thought, well, there were more people alive who knew Mary Pickford at this point. This is, we're talking about 1980 now, 81, uh, than anybody else. So I thought I'd do Mary Pickford. And I did a proposal and my agent couldn't sell it to save her life. And, but she kept at it. And finally she sold it after I was about halfway finished with the book. I just forged ahead with the book. And she finally sold it to a guy named Donald I. Fine, 
who was famous in the publishing industry for being incredibly cheap, number one, and for discovering Elmore Leonard, number two. Uh, and he told me that he bought the book for short money because the first movie he ever saw in his life was Mary Pickford Sparrows in 1926. So it was Kismet. And the book was successful, uh, oddly enough, and uh, earned out in about five weeks, six weeks. Uh, and uh, I was off and running. I brought another book with us that is a, a little known book, but it's one of yours. Do you want to <laughs> tell people about this? That's a little thing I did uh, before I moved into trade publishing. It's a collection of interviews with cameramen. Uh, William Clothier, Carl Struess, uh, Linwood Dunn, special effects cameraman at RKO, worked on King Kong, things like that. Very esoteric kind of stuff. But but really interesting things. I'm going to ask you to just tell us a short story about James Wong Howe. That was his name. Which one? The one about the beach and the, and the people on the beach. My first trip to California, uh, I'd never been there before, and uh, I was broke, of course. So I took a cab to James Wong Howe's house, which was up on King's Road, up above Sunset Strip. And uh, we had a wonderful time. He interviewed, introduced me to his wife, Sonora Babb, who was a novelist. And what did he, what did he shoot? Almost everything. He started working for Cecil B. DeMille in 1921 or two and worked through, uh, shot Paul Newman's movies, HUD, Ombre. His last picture was Barbara Streisand, Funny Girl, Funny Lady, Funny Lady, the sequel of Funny Girl. That was his last thing he did before he died. Uh, and he was just a delightful little uh, oriental gnome. And uh, uh, at the end of the interview, I asked him to call me a cab. And he said, you don't have a car? I said, no, I, I don't have a car. I, I have never been to California before. He said, you've never been to California before? He said, you've never seen the Pacific Ocean? And I said, no, I haven't. And I had no plans because taking a cab to the Pacific Ocean would have been extremely expensive and busted my budget. So he said, well, you're going to see the Pacific Ocean. I'll pick you up at your hotel tomorrow. So at 10 in the morning, he picked me up in his Rolls Royce and he was driving and we drove down uh, uh, the coast highway to, I mean, don't, drove down uh, sunset to, the, to uh, the coast highway and he took me to the Santa Monica Pier where they were, happened to be shooting an episode of Columbo with Peter Falk. And uh, we watched and he was, you know, he said, oh, that's Harry. Harry was the DP, the photographer who was working on the episode. He said, I worked with Harry. Uh, and there was a break in the shoot and Harry Wilde looked over, his name was Harry Wilde, and he looked over and said, Jimmy! And the whole crew came to a standstill, and everybody said, that's James Wong Howe. And Jimmy was retired at this point, and uh, a legend in the business, because he was the only Chinese-American cameraman in Hollywood uh, at a time when it was hard enough to get in the union, but he got into the movies before there were unions. So <laughs> he, he was grandfathered in, you might say. So the whole thing came to a stop and everybody came over, the, the crew, the grips, the director, the cameraman, uh, to spend time with James Wong Howe because he'd been retired for a number of years at that point. It was not in good health. Uh, and everybody was just stunned to see him uh, on a film location, you know? So, and I'm just sort of standing there thinking, well, this is what it's like to be with a legend. Your, yeah, one of your first tastes of being with My a very legend. first, my ah, very first. Okay, but not your last. No. Um, and we'll get to that later. Uh, here, you're widely respected as a Hollywood historian and have appeared frequently as an expert source in documentaries. Um, but for many years, you were a book editor and art critic mm -hmm. for The Post here in town. Mm -hmm. How did you make the transition from newspaper writer to full-time biographer. What was it like trying to write two different kinds of things at the same time? It was productive. <laughs> it wasn't hard at all. It was stretching my muscles. Uh, so I, I wasn't just limited to one kind of thing. Uh, and, and I, as I used to explain to people, uh, 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 journalism is my, is my wife, but uh, books are my mistress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And they understood perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Me too. Uh huh. Okay. Well, you've written a best-selling books about John Wayne, John Ford, Cecil B. DeMille, Louis B. Mayer, and co-wrote three books with Robert Wagner. Out of all of these, who stands out the most and why? Well, working with R.J. was a blast because uh, he goes back to, he started working uh, in the movie industry in 1948 uh, and he's still working uh, yeah. at the age of 90. So it was, uh, that's getting as close to in, being in touch with old Hollywood as it's possible to get in, in the 21st century. And he's a delightful man to begin with. It's just, you know, you walk into a restaurant and it's like Charlton Heston parting the Red Sea. Everybody knows him and wants sure. to be, have a picture taken with him and all that. So it's fun. 
uh, plus he's married to Jill St. John. And he's married so to Jill St. John. There. Or as we, she's better known, Tiffany Case and you know, Diamonds Are Forever. The Diamonds Are Forever right. Girl, LeBond Girl. Uh, but it, 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 a biography is a different breed of cat. Uh, and it's it's it can be frustrating and maddening, or it can be uh, surprisingly smooth. The book that I've come to regard as my favorite is the DeMille book, simply because the book I thought the book I wanted to write matched up with the book I actually wrote without having to take in a lot of fabric around the edges. Mm -hmm. It just seemed to fall together because I'd been thinking about him for 30, 40 years at that point. And it was just an ambition of mine to write the definitive life of DeMille because I thought he was a fascinating man and a great director in the silent period. Uh, and I love to write about that period. And he saved everything. Generally, if you're a historian, you have to find workarounds for stuff that you just can't find. You know, you, you, so you have to intuit about what somebody was thinking or saying or doing at a given point. But DeMille kept all of his uh, doodles everything was there so it was just a question of uh, figuring out which file it wanted to be in and looking for it and there it was so i didn't have to uh i didn't have to say on the one hand this on the other hand that it was nailed down yeah. so it was a very productive uh, uh book to write for me satisfying book to write for me speaking of archives where is your archive uh brigham young brigham young university harold Lee library which is where demille's archives are too yeah it's for the same reason they asked <laughs> <laughs> for all the you researchers out there um we can go to the, the next next photo is um and we're going to carrie grant now is this one oh yeah this is archie leach uh archie leach i call it archie leach a brilliant disguise the name of the book is carrie grant a brilliant disguise what was the disguise and what was he hiding from I don't think he was hiding from anything. He was rather open about it. Uh, the, his central conundrum was the fact that he was born a uh, lower middle class in Bristol, England, uh, in a very compromised family situation. His father was an alcoholic pants presser and his mother was emotionally damaged and was institutionalized when he was uh, 11 years old. And his father told him that his mother had died. So he lived the next 20 odd years thinking she was dead. He didn't find out she was alive until he was already working in Paramount Pictures in the middle 30s. Uh, Cary Grant was a construct that Archie Leach devised in order to not be Archie Leach anymore. And he was very open about that. He worked Archie Leach into uh, as inside jokes in a number of his pictures. Um, he was as amused by the fact that he was Archie, born Archie Leach as anybody could be. Uh, and Cary Grant was a, was a, was a performance it was a character that he incrementally put together over a period of years until by the late 30s, it was essentially all there uh, and could be adapted to swashbucklers like Gunga Din or, or romantic comedies like Bringing Up Baby, uh, sl a slapstick like uh, Arsenic and Old Lace or His Girl Friday, uh, or dramas even mm -hmm. like uh, None But the Lonely Heart or Penny Serenade. Uh, but people assume that actors are basically what their persona is. And in Cary Grant's case, there was a large gap mm -hmm. between the man and the persona. When going back to researching, um, tell us about your trip to Bristol. Um, we're gonna be seeing, the viewers are gonna be seeing in the picture of um, his house. Yes, yes. Well, I was lucky. Uh, we have wonderful friends on Palm Beach, uh, Peter and Ann Heap, Sir Peter and Ann Heap. And Peter grew up in Bristol. So I told him I was thinking of working on a book on, uh, on Cary Grant, uh, Bristol's most famous son. And he said, well, I'll take you there. I'll show you around. And he did. And, and Peter was an ambassador in Her Majesty's uh, service. Uh, and uh, to watch Peter working was uh, astonishing. It was like watching Cary Grant work uh, because he's so smooth. And he would walk up to the place where Cary Grant went to middle school, for instance and say, well, my friend and I have come a very long way uh, to Bristol to see the place where Cary Grant went to school. Could you, would you let us come in and see the classrooms where Archie Leach learned to read and write? And they, the, the, please, please come in. I wouldn't have had the nerve 
to approach people like that. I would have written letters and they would have ignored the letters. And then I would have written phone call, made phone calls and emails and, and the whole rigmarole. No, Peter just walked up and introduced himself uh, as Sir Peter Eat from Bristol. And they, they just took him back into their bosom. So it was like uh, going to Westminster Abbey with the Queen. You just had an instant entree all over, all over Bristol. It was. It was a great trip. And I remember saying to Peter, I said, you just, people just let you in. He said, it's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Which for an ambassador, of course it was. Um, if this is another picture that we're showing now. Uh, you ran into a friend there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the statue of uh, Cary Grant in Bristol. He's carrying a script for To Catch a Thief under his arm. You oh, can't see it in the picture. Really? Yeah, it's To Catch a Thief. And uh, he's he's caught in mid-stride looking like he can't wait to get to the set, which was not actually his attitude generally. He, he, he tended to work, go to the set dreading what he was going to have to do because he was always very anxious and, and nervous about performing uh, as Cary Grant, you know. Uh, but they caught, they, they, they emphasized the positive in, in, in that shot because we People see the carrot, you know. It's a good statue. It's a very good statue. Really nice statue. It's a very good statue. Down in the middle of the, of the business the, district. Right, right. So he left Bristol and um, went to America. He got kicked out of school because he wanted to get kicked out of school because he wanted to get out of Bristol. And he knew he wasn't, he was cutting school constantly. His diary that he kept when he was uh, 14 years old uh, basically uh, doesn't mention his father except for one or two passing references. Nothing about his mother, who we thought was dead at that point. And uh, basically, he's just cutting school to go to the movies and to go to the music hall, vaudeville. And he talks about, he sees, he mentions the acts he saw and if he likes them or not. You know, and he made friends with such and such uh, in this act. And he was a stage struck kid. And later that year, he got himself kicked out of middle school. Uh, by, uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter, <laughs> but he got himself kicked out and he apprenticed with a, uh, ac well-known acrobatic troupe called the Bob Pender troupe, uh, which, uh, was his entree into show business. And if you think about it, Cary Grant's, uh, greatness as a comedian and his skills as a performer, essentially all spring from his control of his body and the way he uses his body, uh, but against against another actor, against the the uh, the drift of a scene, something to, to, to pep up a scene. Uh, he was a remarkable athlete all his life. He was six foot two. I don't think he ever weighed more than 180, uh, maintained his weight rigorously. Uh, and so when he's sprinting across that cornfield in North by Northwest with the crop dusting plane after him, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And he's in his middle 50s at that point. And he's oh. running like, you know, Jim Brown breaking, uh, breaking away from the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. True. So when he went to this country, how long did he act under uh, Archie Leach's name? Until he went to work at Paramount Pictures in 1932. He was Archie Leach. Uh, uh, he, he was Archie Leach in vaudeville, uh, in English vaudeville, in American vaudeville. He was Archie Leach uh, when he was working for the Schubert Organization on Broadway and on tour in musical comedies. And he was uh, Archie Leach when he worked with Fay Ray in a play in 1931. That closed in about 30, 30 performances. And from there, he went to Hollywood and changed his name to Cary Grant. And he got the name from? Cary came from the show he was doing with Faye Ray. His character name was Cary Lockwood. And he liked Cary. And he picked Grant from a, from a, a standard list that uh, Paramount had of surnames. You know, so it was Cary from the play he'd done with Faye Ray and Grant from just a general list of Anglo-Saxon they Thanks. had just a list, like pick one from column A. And one. Yes, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't want ethnic names in that period. Right. Because it was thought to be a turnoff for the audience if your name was Archie Leach or Goldberg mm -hmm. or whatever it was. They, 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 wanted, uh, a, 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 they wanted to banish any hint of ethnicity. Hmm. Some, some performers are, are actors and, and some are movie stars. Um, what was he? Or real actors or a movie star? He was both. He was both. He was both. He started. He, he didn't start off as an actor. He started off as a movie star, because he's gorgeous and he stands there and he doesn't really project much. He seems inhibited in his early movies, actually. But by that's in 1932. By 36, 37, he's starting to put it together. That you have to project something in a movie in the same way that you have to project something on stage. You have to project a character, an attitude, as it were. And that's what he starts to do when he's working with Catherine Hepburn and Sylvia Scarlett. And uh, 
uh, Hepburn again and bringing up baby and Irene Dunn. And, and, and he took actresses were really important to him. They freed him up in some way with an actress he liked that he resonated to. He was free. It gave him a sense of, I can do anything. I can hit the ball anywhere and she'll hit it back. And he's much better with skilled actors on the other end than he is with an okay actor who's not particularly interesting. You know, he tends to he tends to respond in kind to who he's working with. Well, the good ones do, I think, right? Some more than others. Mm -hmm. Some more than others. But he's particularly attuned to the other performer he's working for, working with. I'm going to toss out some... Oh, well, before that, this picture that goes with the next question, I'm going to show you this picture. Mm -hmm. what, what was... What was going on with this picture? He was he went through a period in his early days at Paramount, 30, 32, 33, 34. He had an obsession with his neck. He thought his neck was thick and ugly. So whenever possible, he would have a scarf around his neck or his, his collar turned up high, anything to disguise his neck. He got over it later. As if any part of Cary Grant, hello. <laughs> Is but it, it has nothing to do with it. No, you know, know. that, that know. He's, he, he, was, he was a nervous actor. Yeah. He was not a natural actor. He was a natural performer, but he was not a natural actor, if you get my drift. Yeah. Uh, and and he, he would look at himself with a very critical eye, a harshly critical eye, and say, well, this isn't right. This isn't right. And, of course, you or I look at him, and audiences for 80 years have looked at him and said, perfection. Oh, yeah. Perfection. But he looked at himself, and he saw things that needed to be fixed yeah. or hidden. And his neck was one of the things he focused on for a number of years until uh, he just learned to live with his evidently obese neck. <laughs> and his neck, there's nothing wrong with his neck. No. His, his neck's fine. Yes. But he had, there was something that he had to find something wrong. Right, somewhere. right, to correct. Yeah. 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 Okay, if I give you a couple of uh, some names of um, some of his co stars, um, if there are anecdotes or tidbits that come to mind, can you let us know? Mm -hmm. Mae West. Oh, he owed her a lot. She cast him in two of her pictures. They were both extremely successful. They were his first entree to a mass audience in the movies. He didn't really like her. Uh, he thought she was coarse and common. Not. Uh, she would say things like, I ain't, re I ain't ready. Mm -hmm. You know, when they called her to come, I ain't ready. She'd yell out. And he thought that was vulgar. Uh, but she thought he. She thought she said, "Well, she, I I'm old enough that I actually interviewed Mae West. That's how old I am, as you well know." <laughs> uh, and people are always, you knew, it's like you you knew Elizabeth the first, really, you know? <laughs> yes, I did interview Mae West in her in her cocooned pearl apartment at the Ravenswood our apartment house with the mirror over her bed. You can tell us about the that. mirror over her bed, as she put it, so I can see how I'm doing. <laughs> uh, and there was a nude statue of her in the hallway as you came in from modest, the, very from modest. the uh, and it was a lovely statue. She was about four foot eleven. She was tiny, maybe five feet tall, and she had platform shoes with that had like this much a sole to give her some height and a and a and a huge wig that gave her about another six inches. So she didn't look like a dwarf, but she was a tiny woman. But she had the most beautiful skin. There were no wrinkles, no age spots. And she was 78 or 80 when I interviewed her. She was old. And there was no not sign. That old. There was not that old. It's that's old. There was no sign of the usual things that you can't hide, like age spots and you know, or hands. She because she never spent a day in the sun in her life. Yeah. So she how, how did she get <laughs> she told me she couldn't find which her story was as she expressed it to me. She said, I was I was looking for a leading man and I couldn't find one. And she, he basically, he turned the corner and came around and said, hello. And she said, hello. And she said, he was the best looking thing I ever saw in my life. <laughs> if he can talk, I'll take him. <laughs> and of course, he could talk very well. So she worked with him twice. Uh, and she, in Mae West's mind, Mae West was the single most important star in the history of motion pictures. And also the single most important star in the history of Cary Grant because she gave him a leg up. And she was important. She was important, but he was always a little not thrilled with with her because a she was a, a, a kind of he thought vulgar because she was from Brooklyn and didn't disguise it. She was from Brooklyn. My mother was from Brooklyn. Well, uh, uh, and also small, also small. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. 
uh, uh, but uh, but he would take when she made her comeback in the in the late forties, early fifties as a nightclub act. He took uh, Leslie Caron and Caron's date to see her, and he said, "It doesn't matter whether you like her or not. She's one of a kind. You need to experience her." Wow. You know, and they were of course blown away by her. I would say that about Cary Grant. Yeah, frankly. yeah, yeah. Catherine Hepburn. Oh, he loved her because she was fearless. She'd do anything. She was not a physical comedian, but she trusted him. So he taught her how to do falls and tumble and do summers and do, you know, uh, a, a, a full somersault. And she'd never done it in her life. And he just admired her willingness to do stuff like that and trust him. At one point in bringing up baby, she's on his, sh she's on, on his shoulders and he's oh, carrying her on right. his shoulders. Yeah. And, and then she, he does a, she does a tumble and roll. And he said, imagine a movie star who would do that. Because you could hurt yourself. You really could. You could break something doing that stunt. He said that she was absolutely fearless. He thought she, he thought the world of her. And they were friends all their lives. Alfred Hitchcock. Hitch was probably his favorite director because everything was planned out to perfection. You never had to worry about Hitchcock, about a f working in a Hitchcock film because he'd worked everything out on paper, you know? Uh, that said, and they both were working class Englishmen who put all that behind them <laughs> as far as they could, you know, and, and became ar aristocrats in America mm -hmm. for America and re completely reinvented themselves, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and they each knew each other. They each knew a lot about each other. Each of them understood the other in a way that very few people understood either Grant or Hitchcock mm -hmm. late in his career. Hitchcock was giving a speech at, at Oxford. And he said, he said the thing about, and he was telling the, the kids, kids, he was telling the class, he said, the thing about actors is you cannot fool the public. He said, uh, 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 he said, Grace Kelly came off as likable. And she, in fact, was a likable person. He said, and Tippi Hedren came across as cold. And in fact, she was not a likable person. He said, there is only one actor that I'm aware of who is so good at what they do that the public has no idea what they're really like. And somebody in the audience said, Cary Grant. And he said, exactly, exactly. Cause he understood Grant and Grant's issues and Grant understood Hitchcock and Hitchcock's issues because they both came from the same spot, the same place. Grant, I mean, Hitchcock came from outside London and Grant came from Bristol, but they were both lower middle-class kids from England. Speaking of Grace Kelly, Grace Kelly. Oh, he adored Grace Kelly. I think he was a little bit in love with her, actually. Yeah, well, who wasn't? I mean. But he that was his favorite actress. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, Grace Kelly's great. But in his second favorite actress was Ingrid Bergman. Uh, but I, I don't think Grace Kelly was the best actress he ever worked with. She was just stunning, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, Bergman's a much deeper, uh, more assured actress with a wider palette. She also had a much longer career. You know, but he adored Bergman because she was so unpretentious. She would come to work in in, in dungeon in khakis with her hair tied back in a shoelace with a shoelace because it wasn't about she didn't have any pretensions about being a star. It was about the work. She was a very yeah. serious actress. And that's all she really cared about was the performance. Uh, uh, whereas so many people get tied up in the posing of show business and what's. Mm -hmm. The the, po the 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 yeah, the showmanship of yeah. show business and Bergman wasn't like that. So those were his two favorite actresses. So who was his favorite co-star? Was it a woman or? Well, it would have been uh, Grace Kelly, and he loved Irene Dunn too. Okay. He loved actors, as he put it. He said, he said it's like it, it's like throwing a ball back and forth. He said, with some people you throw the ball, and not only don't they throw it back, they don't even catch it. You know, because they're thinking about their next line. They're uh, they're thinking about their dinner. They're thinking about their date after the, they're finished shooting. They're not really in the scene. They're not concentrating. He said with uh, the people like Irene Dunn, with Kelly, with Bergman, they were really there with you. And you could throw something at them and they would respond in kind and in character. And he said, that's when it's fun. Mm -hmm. That's when it's fun. When you get a sense of reciprocity and play. In, sure. in in a moment, in, in in acting. Yeah. It's real then. It's real. It's yeah. real. Yeah. As You're real, not just reading lines. The scene's alive in a way that it's it maybe wasn't necessarily alive on the page. Right. So we went to, to a, a 
festival, the uh, Lone Pine Western Film Festival in Lone Pine, California, which is about three and a half hours north of LA, way out past Death Valley up in the Sierras. It's beautiful, but kind of stark. Um, describe visiting the Gunga Dins set there. We, um, oh yeah, Gunga Din was shot in Lone Pine. The locations were all Lone Pine, which stood in for the Hindu Kush. Junior. Yeah, stood in for the Hindu Kush. And because uh, a number of pictures, whenever they hit, that was the go-to place if you're going to shoot a picture about the British Raj in India, you'd go to Lone Pine because it looked like Northern India, basically. Uh, and uh, a, a guy who devoted his life to Gunga Din, basically, took us on a tour of the locations for uh, uh, Gunga Din and the, uh, uh, the headquarters for the, for the Thug E cult, uh, the, where he showed us where the building was built. And he said, as a matter of fact, when they tore it down a year or two after the film was made, they tore the set down because it was made out of wood and plaster like most sets are. He said, they all th they threw everything in the river. He said, if you want, you can go pick out a piece of the temple of Kali. Temple of Kali. <laughs> and I went over and by God, he wasn't kidding. There were dozens of pieces of plaster from the temple of Kali that were still in the riverbank from 80 years ago from the production yeah, yeah. from the production of uh, Gunga Din. And then he took us to a rock. There's a sequence where they're moving an elephant across yeah. a rope bridge. The picture of it. The, right. right now. And uh, they, they get the they get the sense of of the uh, 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 moving it over a a, 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 ravine. a a ravine with a match shot. But actually they're about 10 12 feet off the ground. Uh but you can see the, the, the iron spike that was driven into the rock to hold the rope bridge for the scene is still there. So nothing changes in, in Lone Pine. The rocks are the rocks, you know, but it's all still there. And if you, if you know the film very well, you can see this was where the Temple of Kali was right there. And this is where the parade ground was right there where they buried Gunga Din. You know, and and this is where they move the elephant across the rope bridge. So one, like, and one of the best museums we've ever seen. Oh yeah, it's just a Great spectacular museum. museum. Um, oh my god! Oh my god! Who does the best impression of Cary? Grant? Oh, Robert Wagner. Robert Wagner can do about thirty-five <laughs> seconds recreating an entire scene from Gunga Din, including the trumpeting of the elephant sure. as they move the elephant across the rope bridge with movements. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, it's he's a wonderful man. He, he's uh, Cary Grant said Robert Wagner did the best Cary Grant, and it's it's a virtuoso, uh, it's a virtuoso piece of, of imitation. It really is. It's true. Uh, the next picture, I'm going to ask you, what's the most embarrassing costume that Cary Grant ever had to wear, or the most embarrassing, you know, like makeup or mm -hmm. like a, mm -hmm. for instance? Well, oh, yeah, I'll show you what they're showing. Okay. No, not that one. Excuse me. Oh, well, that's from I Was a Male War Bride. Even just the title. Yeah, right? it's a great title. Where uh, he has to masquerade as a woman uh, for very complicated reasons because he's married <laughs> to Ann Sheridan and they're trying to get across a border and he can't, he, he's not, he's not uh, supposed to be going across the border. So he has to uh, play a whack and he plays it. Now, generally, when actors are in drag in a movie, they camp it up like, say, Jack Lemon mm -hmm. and Tony Curtis and. Some like it hot, like where well, you don't really believe they're women for a moment, right? You know, because Especially they can't walk, in right? High because heels. they can't walk in high heels. Uh, and the thing about Grant is he doesn't try to camp it up, he's furious at having to be in character. The character is livid that he has to do something this demeaning <laughs> in order to be with his wife. So he's glow, he's glowering throughout the entire picture, and he wears this absurd Louise Brooks wig, a page boy wig, oh. which is the most incongruous possible thing if Cary Grant's going to be dressed in drag. He shouldn't wear a page boy wig, you know. So it's it's very funny. It takes a long time to get there. Last, uh, he's only in drag for about 20, 25 minutes. And it takes about 60 or 70 minutes to get him there. And then if there's like 15 or 20 minutes after he's out of the drag. So it's kind of a comedy procedure. I call it a comedy procedural. We don't really care why he has to get in drag. We just want to see him get there. <laughs> right. He liked, he, he, he did uh, several, uh, he put on a peignoir. And well, in Breaking Up Baby, he dresses, a, he, he plays a very kind of a fetching peignoir yeah, yeah. because his clothes are being laundered and there's nothing else to put on. So right. he puts a peignoir right. on. He's very, he's very fetching. He looks good and everything. Yeah. Uh, and he loved, uh, he loved making 
the, the movie that we're going to show the picture of next time, Father Goose. Yeah. Because... Because he said it was one of the few times he played someone who was a lot like him. Mm -hmm. Kind of misanthropic, uh, self-absorbed. Uh, and when he wasn't working, he, he didn't dress up in a tux and look like Cary Grant. He'd, he'd go around in a bathrobe. And, on set? Uh, no, no, not on set, but at home. Oh, okay. At home. Oh, he didn't, okay. you know, he dressed very casually around the yeah, house yeah. In, in floppy slippers. You know, he, he didn't, he, he was being Archie, you might say, rather than Carrie. Right, right. And so in Father Goose, uh, he can clearly see he's having a wonderful time playing a grump. You know, a guy who's lived alone for 40 years and likes it that way. And here he is being harassed by an annoying school teacher and six uh, 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 pubescent girls none of whom he has wants to have anything to do with. So it's a, it's just a kind of a grumpy, misanthropic performance, and, and it's very really funny. Better than the movie. The performance is actually better than the movie. It's, it's a fun movie. Uh, our next our next picture is the debonair, mm -hmm. Cary Grant. Mm -hmm. But he um, was also known for um, taking a lot of what drug? Uh, LSD. Like how many times? Well over 100. Lots. Well over hundreds. He spent several years dropping acid, uh, which he undertook because psychotherapy had failed him. And he had come to a point in his life where he didn't know what else to do. Because if you start out poor and and without any leverage, you think naturally enough that when, if I can get money and if I get position and if I get leverage, my problems won't be there anymore. That you think your problems are a function of income and, and, and uh, uh, possessions mm -hmm. and you go through and 30 years later, you wake up and you've got all those things and you still have the same problems. And his problem was basically the fact that he was Archie Leach and he was playing Cary Grant. He wasn't really Cary Grant. He was inside. He was still anxious, nervous, Archie Leach. Uh, and he wanted to try to integrate these two, these two personalities that had been warring inside him for decades. Uh, and psychotherapy hadn't worked and marriage hadn't worked. He was on his uh, third marriage by that time. He was married how many times? Five. Five times. Uh, the third marriage was getting shaky at that point, and he was frantic. He didn't know what else to do. So uh, he tried LSD. It was a legal substance at that point, and according to him, it basically gave him a new life. It enabled him to see uh, his hypocrisies, as he put it, and his uh, his hip, his yeah, hypocrisy that was the word he used. Uh, it enabled him to get past his uh, pretens social pretensions. It enabled him to unit unify Archie with Carrie finally. Wow. And uh, uh, the thing of it was, the people that worked with him and knew him since thought he was the same guy after acid as he was before acid. <laughs> Uh, but it, but in but, for him in right. his head right. it made a big difference okay. even though it didn't necessarily affect his outward behavior. That's the point of it. Um, when he died in 1986, was he all Carrie? He got very close to Carrie. Retirement made a big difference for him. Having he finally had more money than he could ever spend, which was important to him because he was one of those poor people who had been poor as a child and needed a lot of the insulation that amounts of money can give you so he could feel secure. Uh, he, he, he didn't have to worry at all about working. Uh, and he had his daughter, finally, he had a daughter with Diane Cannon, his fourth wife, and he adored children. I, I talked to several children who worked with him over the years, and he was special with children. He would take time with them, because most movie stars, they don't really take time with a child actor because child actors are cute and they'll just dist detract attention from you to them, you know? Right. And he, kids and animals, right? Kids Never and animals. And he, he didn't particularly like working with animals, but he did like working with kids. He would take time with them. He would give them hints about acting. He would explain a scene to them, how to, how to best appear in the scene and possibly take attention away from him. He didn't care. He was really good with kids, both professional kids and non-professional kids. Wasn't there one actor? Oh boy, he was really good with who talked with you. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, the little kid in a movie called Once Upon a Time. Yeah, yeah. They were doing a scene where the director wanted to play the scene on Grant. That was the kid where they say goodbye to each other. He said, no, 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 no. This has to be a close-up on the boy. This has to be a close-up on the boy. He said, put my shoulder in there so they know I'm in the shot. But it has to be a close-up on the boy. 
he wouldn't let the director do what he wanted to do. And the director tried to talk, and I said, no, because Grant had that kind of leverage where he could tell a director, not Alfred Hitchcock, but he could tell second level directors, you know, what, what, what he wanted done with a scene. And he did. He didn't use that prerogative terribly often, but he was willing to in that, in that case. Did you ever meet him or his daughter? I interviewed Jennifer. Uh, I never met Cary Grant. I saw him at the end of his life do, he was doing a series of one night stands called A Conversation with Cary Grant. He would do one a month, for instance. Uh, and he would go into Schenectady or, or Pomona or Fort Lauderdale. That's where I saw him in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, basically, they would do a mon there was a montage of his film film clips for six or seven minutes. He would come out. He would sit in a stool. Uh, there would be microphones in the audience. And he would simply take questions for ninety minutes. Whatever people asked him, he would. And he was he was he looked great. He had a full head of white hair, mm -hmm. wore a horn rim black glasses, uh, was in complete control and very relaxed. And uh, you could see that Carrie and Archie were unified. You know. Because while he would talk, he would present himself as Cary Grant, and he dressed like Cary Grant, beautiful talks. Uh, the conversation, what he actually said, once you got past who was your favorite movie star, who, who did you like to kiss, those kinds of, you know, questions that people ask. Uh, he would talk about that acting is a lot more than memorizing dialogue. You have to hit lines. You have to make sure the light is, you, you have to hit your mark so the light's on you. He's, and he would talk about, I remember in Fort Lauderdale, he talked about the technical aspect of it, that you, you, if you have to mix a drink in a scene, for instance, you have to put ice cubes in, you have to pour the drink. Uh, and if you don't put the right ingredients in, someone's going to notice and write a letter <laughs> yeah, right. or a critic's going to notice and write a letter. So you actually have to be thinking while the dialogue is going, about the ingredients of the drink. You have to make sure if you take a drink, sip from the drink, that the ice cubes don't uh, bump against the glass and wipe out the dialogue. All these technical issues that no one really thinks about when you're watching a simple scene like a man mixing a drink and taking a sip. But he said it's, it's but they were all technical issues. It wasn't emotional stuff. It wasn't like being real in a scene. It was, it was a talk, he was talking about technique of acting, the technique of, of acting, getting a laugh, which is all timing and beats. He's a, he's an amazing person. We but we've we've met a lot of amazing people over the years. And then this next um, photo is uh, is two people that you've talked about already. Huh. RJ and Joe. And this was at the launch of your first book with mm -hmm. him. Pieces New of York. my heart. Yeah. Pieces of my heart. Uh, and you brought uh, when you first met him. The first meeting you had with him was here. You both both Charles brought, Crabbe. Right. Late right. lamented Charlie yes, Crabbe. Yes, the former. You both brought photos to that well, I first. I didn't know. I, I know. Well, I <laughs> I made you take a photo. I made you go at the door. I didn't at the door. Right. But when you got there, what did you got there? there photos of? He had a picture. He he brought out a picture of his German shepherd who was named Larry after Olivia. He and Olivia had been friends since they did a production of Cat and Hot and Roof together in the seventies with Natalie Wood, and I pulled out a picture of my dog Cooper. My German, black German Shepherd, silver and black German Shepherd, who was named after Gary Cooper. So we bonded over our mutual passion shepherds. for German Shepherds. Shepherds. Uh, what Car what Cary Grant movie best describes our life together? I know my Charade. <laughs> Not my answer. What was your answer? Bringing, Bringing up baby? baby? Who's the baby? <laughs> no, uh, actually, uh, baby was a leopard. I can't give you anything but love. Baby. baby. <laughs> Baby was a leopard. A leopard. Leopard. In who the answers? Movie. Who who answers to that song? Right. They have to keep singing the that's song. That's how the leopard was trained. We have quite a few animals, so that's that was one of the reasons I was basing on that. And we have a lot of good times too. We do. Thank you. Like this, for that's instance. right. Like this. Again, we thank the the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County. This has been a wonderful time, and we hope you've had a good time too. Thank you. Thank you.